Hi, Lagim fam. As promised earlier this week on Instagram, just in time for my birthday, I am publishing one of my Patreon episodes as a bonus episode here on the regular feed. I'm quite excited for you to listen to this episode about Michelle Rivera Nice, and I'm hoping to entice you to join our Patreon Lagim fam as well, because I will be publishing even more stories about Filipinos abroad and in the diaspora. So without further ado, here is the episode. Good day, dear patrons. Welcome to another bonus episode here on Patreon. As you know, I publish bonus episodes every month, and depending on your chosen tier, you either get to hear one or two bonus episodes every month. To learn more about what each tier offers, make sure to check Lagim's Patreon link below in the show notes. If you are new to our Legim Patreon fam, in these bonus episodes, I cover true crime stories involving Filipinos in the diaspora. These cases are sometimes very well known, but some are barely written about. These episodes, therefore, may vary in length, but I also make sure to provide you with update episodes, especially in cases that are new or are still ongoing. Now, without further ado, let me tell you the story of Michelle Rivera Nice, a beautiful Filipina who was born in Mibantang, Bukidnon, but grew up in Orion, Bataan. Her story seemed to have started like countless stories of young Filipinas who grew up in poverty, but who found themselves falling in love with a foreign man who promised an easier and better life abroad. Although these stories are hardly fairy tales, Michelle's story nevertheless seemed to have devolved into a horrific nightmare. This is the story of Michelle Rivera Nice. Michelle Rivera Nice was actually born Michelle Rivera, but for everybody's ease, she just shortened her name to Michelle. She was the middle child of seven. The family originally were from Bukidnon, but migrated to Bataan at some point. Life was tough for the family, who now needed to, on top of other things, learn new skills such as fishing in order to earn some money for food and other necessities when they were in Bataan. Michelle, according to her sister, had always been the most intelligent of all the children. She was also described as kind and hardworking. Unfortunately, money was tight in the family, and so Michelle, who managed to get into college, had to stop and drop out. Not long after, Michelle was persuaded to put her picture and details on one of those pen pal sections in a magazine. It did not take long afterwards for letters from suitors to come flooding in. One particular suitor was persistent in persuading Michelle after a friend of his showed him an ad with Michelle's photo and details. Jonathan Nice was eager to know the 19-year-old Filipina beauty. Jonathan Nice was one of four boys. He was the son of a machine designer, and he grew up in a working-class neighborhood near Collegeville, Pennsylvania. The family is Catholic, and were well regarded in the community. In 1968, Jonathan headed to Temple University in Philadelphia. It took eight years for him to work his way through undergrad school, but he eventually earned his bachelor's degree in 1976. Two years later, he got his master's degree, and in 1983, he completed his thesis on colon cancer and earned a Ph.D. from the Fels Research Institute at Temple University in Philadelphia. After a couple of postdoctoral stints in Los Angeles, 
he got a job at East Carolina University in Greenville in 1987, and then he was promoted to full professor in 1988. He then moved to North Carolina, and this is where a friend of his showed him Michelle's ad. The letter writing started soon enough. It is understandable that Michelle and Jonathan did not really fall for each other right away, but when Michelle's sister asked her a few months into the pen pal relationship, it seemed to her like her sister was falling in love. What was not to like about Jonathan? Yes, he was a chunk older than Michelle, but he seemed accomplished with a stable job and from a good family. So, after exchanging letters for about a year, Jonathan actually went to the Philippines and in 1990, the two married. Jonathan then returned to the United States and about six months later, Michelle arrived at her new home in North Carolina. To many, it looked like Michelle was some sort of mail-to-order bride, but her family insisted that this was not the case at all. They maintained that no money exchanged hands in that one year Jonathan and Michelle wrote to each other. And so, in order to avoid any nasty rumors, the couple would usually just tell people that they had met in Hawaii. Whatever anyone thought, the unlikely couple were not to be stopped, though. They settled into a huge house worth $800,000 in Hopewell Township, and eventually they had a daughter and two sons. To many friends and acquaintances, Michelle and Jonathan had made an unlikely pair, as I already said. By 2003, Michelle, who was 34 years old and stood 5 foot 2 inches, was known to be an avid exerciser. She was outgoing and always had a radiant smile. Jonathan, on the other hand, was the intellectual one. He was socially awkward and he was 53 years old. Still, the two at that time had been married for nearly 15 years and seemed happy. However, by 2003, things in their marriage had been brewing already. In order to understand why things happened the way they happened, we need to backtrack to 2001 and 2002. During these years, the Nice family hired a landscaping firm to do some work at their home and garden. By 2002, one of its employees, Miguel de Jesus, knocked on the door to inquire about the bill and finally met Michelle. The two exchanged cell phone numbers and communicated frequently thereafter. And then, they eventually began a sexual relationship. This relationship would remain a secret until Jonathan learned about it in July 2003. It is not clear whether Jonathan confronted his wife right away, but what we do know is that Jonathan contacted Miguel de Jesus, leaving a message to stay away from his wife or he would be a dead man. That month, Jonathan also contacted the FBI, claiming that Miguel de Jesus was trying to extort money from him. As a result, the FBI referred the matter to the local police where the Nice family lived. The local police proceeded to interview Jonathan, who claimed that he received two phone calls, presumably from de Jesus, on July the 10th, 2003. The caller was seeking to extort $500,000 in exchange for a tape recording of Michelle having sex with someone. The police could not trace the calls back to Miguel de Jesus, and after having several conversations with Jonathan and also eventually Michelle, the investigating officer concluded that the charges were unfounded and they refused to take any action. Jonathan then signed a harassment complaint against de Jesus. 
this complaint would be conditionally dismissed if de Jesus refrained from contacting Jonathan and Michelle for two years. Now, whilst this might sound like things may have turned a corner at this point, Michelle, in fact, resumed her relationship with de Jesus weeks later after this event. At this point in Jonathan and Michelle's relationship, Jonathan had lost his job and the family's huge home had to be put up for sale. Jonathan was on the hunt for a new job and in the meantime, Michelle had to take a retail job selling Chanel cosmetics at Macy's in a local mall. Jonathan would later claim that she only went to work to gain experience so she could hopefully start her own perfume company someday. With the financial problems that the family faced at this point, many cracks appeared in the marriage between Michelle and Jonathan. Friends and family of Michelle later on would also report how Michelle also suffered from Jonathan's controlling behavior, which he had always had. Supporters of Michelle would also later speculate that what eventually led to Michelle's infidelity was a myriad of things already mentioned, but also Jonathan's absence from the home when he was still working. And he used to work a lot of hours and long hours at that. Michelle at some point may have felt lonely and was emboldened to pursue a relationship with de Jesus. But then again, these are all speculations and we may never know what really drove Michelle to betray Jonathan. All we know was that she continued the relationship and continued to secretly meet with de Jesus at motels near where she lived. Which brings us back to January of 2004. On the 15th of January 2004, Michelle arranged to meet de Jesus at 9.15 in the evening after she finished work at Macy's. After meeting, they drove to Hamilton Plaza and left Michelle's Toyota Land Cruiser there. Afterwards, de Jesus drove her to the Mounts Motel in Lawrenceville. After engaging in sexual relations, they took a shower and Michelle got dressed and put on some perfume. De Jesus drove her back to Hamilton Plaza to get Michelle to her car. Michelle went home afterwards. Miguel de Jesus, on the other hand, drove to a bar and had a few drinks before he went home to his girlfriend, who believed that he has only been out drinking. Yes, Miguel de Jesus was also in a relationship with someone else whilst having this tryst with Michelle. This will become minorly significant later. The next day, on the 16th of January at 6.58 a.m., Hopewell police officer Lincoln Karnoff was dispatched to the Nice's home on a report from an alarm company that the basement burglar alarm had been activated. Around the same time, Public Service Electric and Gas Company employee Richard Archer saw a car, a Land Cruiser, with its engine still running, resting against an embankment on Jacobs Creek Road. He did not immediately investigate, and I do not know why such a discovery would not prompt somebody to immediately investigate what is going on, but anyway, after breakfast, Richard Archer told the driver of the gas company vehicle, Chuck Black, to pull over. Archer then walked down the embankment and saw a woman inside the car. She was slumped over on a pillow with her eyes open. He then noticed footprints leading away from the car and across the ice on the creek and up the other side of the embankment. He also noted minimal damage to the vehicle and also frozen blood on the running board. Archer shared his discovery with Chuck Black, who immediately called the police. 
Afterwards, various Hopewell police officers responded to the scene. In addition to the observations made by Archer earlier on, the police observed a few more things that gave them pause. They saw blood on the exterior of the rear driver's side door. They also noted the footprints leading away from the car and took photographs and cast impressions accordingly. They then learned that the vehicle was registered to the nicest family home address, which was not too far away from where Richard Archer and Chuck Black found the vehicle. Hopewell Police Officers Sergeant Michael Seremsak and Officer Michael Sherman then thought it would be best to head to the nice family home right away. They arrived there at around 9.13 in the morning. They walked through a single open garage door and knocked on the door from the garage to the house. Two young children answered and said neither of their parents was home, but that their father, who had taken their brother to school, would be home soon. And so the officers decided to wait in their police car until Jonathan, appearing sort of disheveled, drove up to the home. Officer Saramsak told him that they needed to talk and asked if they could come in. Jonathan agreed and drove up the driveway and parked in front of the house, simultaneously closing the open garage door. Then they all entered through the front door of the house. Officer Saramsak then advised Jonathan that the Land Cruiser, registered to the Nice family, had been in an accident. Jonathan said that his wife used that vehicle and he asked how she was and what hospital she was in. Instead of responding to Jonathan, the officers asked him when he last saw her. Jonathan responded that she was supposed to work from 6 p.m. until 10 p.m. and then she was supposed to go out with a friend. Jonathan told the officers that Michelle had told him she would be home by 1 a.m., but he knew from experience that she would not get home until later and sometimes did not come home until the next morning. Officer Saramsak then excused himself and called his supervisor, Lieutenant Frank Fetcher, and told him about Jonathan closing the garage door when he arrived at the house. He found this odd and thought that it was worth looking further into this whilst Jonathan was still being interviewed because he could be a possible person of interest. Whilst this was ongoing in the home of the Nice family, the coroner at the crime scene was ready to tell the police officers that the woman in the Land Cruiser was most definitely Michelle. He passed this information to the two officers who were, at that moment, interviewing Jonathan. When the officers told Jonathan, they also made it a point to tell him of his rights, and they also told him that they needed an official statement from him. They explained to him that he was not a suspect at this time. Jonathan indicated to the officers that he understood what was being said to him, but what struck the officers was that Jonathan did not appear to be upset about the news of Michelle's death at all. Moving on with the interview, Officer Saramsak then asked Jonathan if Michelle had been seeing anyone else. Jonathan said she had. He then started explaining the issue with Miguel de Jesus allegedly attempting to extort money from the family. The officers took this information on board and continued their preliminary investigation. The police officers then asked Jonathan if they could check the home's basement to see if there were any signs of intrusion or of anything suspicious at all. Jonathan permitted this. It is not clear whether the two police officers found anything, but what we do know is that both officers then left the house and decided to wait outside in their police car. At approximately 10.45 in the morning, investigating officer Danny McCown and Mercer County Prosecutor's Detective Sergeant Karen Ortman arrived at Jonathan's house. McCown and Ortman went to the front door and rang the doorbell. 
and they were greeted by Jonathan's daughter. They told her that they would like to speak to her dad. The two officers then had to wait 15 minutes before Jonathan appeared to greet them. When Jonathan opened the door, they noticed that his hair was a mess. His clothes were wrinkled and he was wearing no shoes or socks. McCown asked Jonathan to come to the station to give a statement and he agreed, accepting McCown's offer to drive him to the police station. On the way, Jonathan stated that de Jesus's quote-unquote wife had to be involved in Michelle's death, a seemingly random information to give at that moment. Nevertheless, the officers made a note of this statement. At the police station, Jonathan was questioned for two and a half hours. The officers deemed his answers to the questions as sort of improbable. Jonathan shared the extortion attempt from the previous summer and added that Michelle told him how Miguel de Jesus had made threats against Jonathan when talking to Michelle. He also alleged that de Jesus called him once screaming he was, quote, going to kill the bitch, obviously referring to Michelle. Jonathan also claimed that Michelle told him that de Jesus' partner had sent Michelle, quote, nasty text messages. He asserted that Michelle told him that she needed a new car because people were following her from work and that she suspected it was de Jesus or one of his friends. At one point in Jonathan's questioning, the conversation veered into footwear, something that would prove important later in the police's investigation. Jonathan let it drop that he wore size 12 shoes. The police would make a note of this, but they made notes of other things they had observed as well. Officer McCown, for example, noticed some small cuts on Jonathan's hands, which he agreed to have photographed. The police officers then asked if they could swab his inner cheeks for DNA comparison, and Jonathan surprisingly said yes. After the interview was over, Officer McCown drove Jonathan to his son's school to pick him up. On the way, Jonathan said that he really had thought things were going to work out between him and Michelle, but admitted that he and his wife fought about her moving out of the house. Now, this was new information, which probably signaled to Officer McCown that things in the marriage were worse than they initially believed. Officer McCown then asked when they last had that conversation about Michelle leaving the house, and Jonathan replied, last night. McCown probably thought at this point if this conversation had triggered something that ended up in Michelle's death. Meanwhile, at the crime scene at the embankment, state trooper Jeffrey Noble made a number of compelling observations that led him to conclude that Michelle's death was not consistent with a car accident. This was aided and confirmed when later the medical examiner Rafat Ahmad arrived at the scene. Rafat Ahmad said that based on the injuries to the victim's forehead, the, quote, accident looked very much staged. The police officers and the medical examiner worked hard that day, and finally, by six in the evening, they were able to remove Michelle's body from the Land Cruiser when the officers and the medical examiner concluded their initial examination at the scene something that is immensely important, by the way, to understand the crime at hand and before the body is ultimately transported to the medical examiner's office. Dr. Ahmed, upon being able to examine Michelle closer at her office, reiterated what she had said at the crime scene already. The injuries Michelle sustained were not consistent with someone who was in a car accident, not by a long stretch. Now, having put together the information from the medical examiner and the observations they made so far, the police officers had a strong belief that Michelle was ultimately killed at her home. So they acted quickly. 
At about 8.30 that evening, a team of state and municipal officers went to Jonathan's home and asked him to vacate it, pending the issuance of a search warrant. Jonathan asked to call a lawyer and did so, leaving a message when he was unable to reach said lawyer. The police did not question him at this time. Jonathan then took a few personal items and left the home. He was not permitted to take his cell phone. He then gathered his children from the home of a friend and told his friend that he was taking the children to his parents' home in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. The next morning, news of Michelle's death had hit the headlines, and the little community where the nicest lived was shaken to its core. On the 17th of January the next day, Michelle's official autopsy took place. These are the findings of Dr. Ahmad, the medical examiner. Michelle had three deep, gaping lacerations to her forehead, an extensive skull fracture, and massive intracranial hemorrhages caused by excessive force. She had multiple other internal and external injuries, including defensive wounds. From the froth that had developed in Michelle's lungs, Ahmad determined that she had lived for 10 minutes after the trauma had been inflicted on her body. The cause of her death was massive blunt force trauma to the head, fractures of the skull, contusions of the brain, and intracranial bleeding. Meanwhile, the police only managed to obtain their search warrant by 10.30 in the morning on the 17th. What was not helpful once they did have the warrant was the fact that they did not have enough officers to conduct the search, so they had to wait until 6 that evening before they could conduct a proper search of the home. Now, bear in mind the house was big. The house had 17 rooms, a full basement, an attic, and a three-car garage. It took some time to process the whole house. Now, in the garage, New Jersey State Police Detective John Ryan had started processing the area. And right off the bat, he noticed what looked like blood on the garage door's rail and jam. Upon further inspection, more blood was observed on a snowblower, wet vacuum, and a recycling bucket in the garage that contained a bloody sock. There were blood stains on the garage floor that someone had attempted to clean, it looked like. There was also a partial bloody footprint in the garage. Soaking wet large pajama pants were also found behind a couch in an upstairs office and reddish brown water was found in the washing machine. It looked like Officer Ryan hit the mother load of evidence. By Sunday, the 18th of January, Jonathan voluntarily returned to the Hopewell Police Station quite early in the morning. Again, he was read his rights, or what in the U.S. is called being Mirandized, after the landmark case of Miranda versus Arizona, which cemented into U.S. law that a person being arrested should be read his rights, such as having the right to remain silent or the right to legal representation. Jonathan was, as I said, informed of these rights, and he also signed a form that indicated that he was not under the influence of alcohol or any drugs or medication at the point of questioning. The second round of questioning could therefore now start. State Police Detective Sergeant William Skull had joined the interrogation and got right to the point. He told Jonathan that they did not believe Michelle died in a car accident and that the evidence collected so far was implicating him. At this point, Jonathan knew he had become a person of interest and said that Maybe it would be best for him to get an attorney if he was a suspect. 
Skull confirmed that indeed he was now a suspect and he should decide whether he wanted a lawyer or not. Jonathan then thought and then backtracked and said he did not want a lawyer after all. The questioning therefore continued, and Jonathan insisted that the police should be looking at De Jesus and his partner based on Michelle's affair and the alleged extortion attempt. He claimed that Michelle was so afraid of De Jesus's partner that she had disabled the light bulbs in the garage so she could not be seen in it. Skull replied that this story did not make sense to him. Jonathan then asked whether he should obtain the opinion of an attorney regarding his theory of Michelle's murder. Skull told him that he could not give him any advice about this and asked him what he wanted to do. Did he now want to call a lawyer or not? Jonathan then asked if he could go home and think about it, but Skull told him that there was probable cause to arrest him officially and that he was not free to leave the police station. Jonathan reiterated that he did not want a lawyer. He then did something rather odd. He offered to make an incriminating statement in exchange for a short jail term so he could take care of his children. Skull said that he would not bring such a suggestion to the prosecutor and for the third time asked whether Jonathan wished to exercise his constitutional rights to have legal representation. Jonathan again said no. The officers in the questioning room noticed how Jonathan's demeanor became deflated and how he suddenly grew quiet. He repeatedly said, quote, I did not kill my wife. Skull then asked him to define the word kill, to which Jonathan replied, shoot, stab, or choke. The questioning continued, and at some point, Skull told Jonathan that he could not convince him that he was not involved in Michelle's death and asked if he were in Skull's place whether he would believe his denial. Jonathan thought about it and replied, probably not. By 10.24 in the morning, police captain George Meyer interrupted the interview and called Skull out of the room. Jonathan's brother, Michael Nice, who was at the police station, had received a phone call from Lee Engelman, the lawyer whom Jonathan had called Friday evening. Engelman had told Michael that he wanted Jonathan to call him and asked Michael to tell him to stop talking to the police. Michael wrote Engelman's number on a piece of paper and relayed Engelman's instruction for Jonathan to the police. Captain George Meyer conveyed the information to Skull and handed the piece of paper to him. Skull returned to the interview room and told Jonathan that Engelman had called and wanted him to return the call. He put the piece of paper with the phone number on the table in front of Jonathan and told him that the lawyer would probably tell him not to talk to the police. Skull told Jonathan for the fourth time that he needed to make a decision, and Jonathan pushed the paper away and said he wanted to be helpful and did not want to call the lawyer. Skull asked Jonathan what was stopping him from giving his version of events since he insisted that he did not kill his wife. Jonathan suddenly became quiet and then said he wanted to know whether Michelle had been with De Jesus the night she died. Skull, who was now more updated about Michelle's whereabouts before she was found by the embankment, said she had indeed been with De Jesus as per their initial investigation. Jonathan then became somewhat emotional and asked how he could be sure that Skull was telling the truth. Skull said it was up to him to determine whether he was being honest or not. 
Skull, at this point, felt like he could push the interrogation a bit further and added some more information that the police found out about Michelle. He may have thought that if he revealed what he knew to Jonathan and signaled to him that the police were on to him, Jonathan might come clean. And he would be right. Skull told Jonathan that he knew Jonathan had called Michelle on her cell phone, but that she had turned it off. He also told Jonathan that they believed she had doused herself in perfume before she came home, probably to mask the smell of de Jesus on her. Upon hearing this, Jonathan stated, I did not mean to kill her. In an unrecorded statement, Jonathan explained that the children tried to call their mother before they went to sleep, but that the call went straight to voicemail. He then took lorazepam and went to sleep. He woke up at midnight and called Michelle's cell phone again, but again it went straight to voicemail. He said after that he went back to sleep. Jonathan then said that he was awakened at 2 in the morning by the sound of car tires crunching on the snow outside. He went to the garage to talk to Michelle, who had just arrived, because he suspected that she had been with Miguel de Jesus. He claimed that he got to the garage door before she got out of the Land Cruiser, When she opened the car door, he stood in the space created by the open door and asked where she had been. She refused to answer, and Jonathan claimed she tried to attack him with a stiletto shoe. He said he then grabbed her hand, put his other hand on her back, and pushed her onto the garage floor. He heard a thunk and she started bleeding profusely, according to Jonathan. The bleeding started from her head. He claimed he went inside to get some compressed gauze, and when he returned, she was on her stomach on the floor with her shoe still in her hand. He knelt on her back, and she started to flail in an attempt to assault him again with the shoe. Jonathan then said that he pushed her head down again hitting her forehead on the floor. Michelle then stopped moving. Jonathan tried to find a pulse, but failed to find one. He then realized that his wife was dead. Jonathan then explained how he faked the car accident and what he did to clean up and hide the evidence at his home. After explaining these events, Jonathan agreed to give a taped statement. He asked for a pen and paper to write down some thoughts, and Skull gave them to him. Skull then left the interrogation room to relay what he had just learned from Jonathan. He thought that the information would become pertinent to the search, which was to resume that very day. At 12.03 that afternoon, Jonathan began his taped statement, and it lasted until 1.48 in the afternoon. Additional hidden evidence was later retrieved from his home based on the information he had provided. The case progressed as it should, and by June 2005, the prosecution was ready to bring the case to the court. The trial started on the 21st of June 2005. The trial, like countless trials involving a murder charge, was harrowing, especially for those who supported and loved Michelle. According to reports, dozens of photographs of bloody items in the nice home were shown as exhibits. There was also a photo of Michelle Nice's bloody and gruesomely battered corpse. Bizarrely enough, There was also a sexually explicit, intensely emotional love poem written by Jonathan. This was presented as part of the evidence, although it is not clear whether this was supposed to aid the prosecution 
or the defense. The prosecution's theory of the case was as expected. Jonathan Nice, who had now been charged with first-degree murder and fourth-degree evidence tampering and who ended up pleading not guilty, killed Michelle in a jealous rage the night of the 16th of January 2004. She was returning home from her latest tryst in a motel with her lover and landscaper Miguel de Jesus. The prosecution presented their witnesses, which included State Police Detective John Ryan, the two gas company workers, Richard Archer and Chuck Black. The prosecution drove the point home that Jonathan faked the accident to cover up his murderous actions and that he said as much during the questioning at the police station. Now, just as a side note here, Jonathan's lawyers did try to have the taped statement suppressed, but the judge who presided over the motion hearing denied the defense's motion. The taped statement was transcribed and read in court later in the trial. In the trial as well, Detective Ryan also read out the poem Jonathan wrote about Michelle, and it became clear at this point that the poem was being submitted as the prosecution's evidence. The poem went like this. Michelle, your stainless steel heart, like a knife, rips open my soul to bleed, unattended, dying. With another man's semen still warm within your belly, you call me on the telephone and tell me not to worry. When, oh when, will my dying end? Detective Ryan said he did not know if Jonathan had shown the poem to his wife and had no reason to believe he had done so. Defense attorney Robin Lord raised no objection during the testimony as to the poem. With Detective Ryan on the stand taking questions from Assistant Prosecutor Thomas Mide, hours were spent introducing more photos as evidence without objection from the defense. The photos were mostly of the garage where the prosecution said Jonathan had killed Michelle by repeatedly slamming her head face down on the concrete floor. Other photos showed bloodstains and bloody footprints on the garage floor with swipe marks that the detective said could indicate an effort to clean them up. The prosecution also showed photos of the blood spatters on the snowblower and a recycling barrel in the garage. All the photos were projected onto a large screen in the courtroom. The screen faced the jury and was also visible to the gallery. Making sure that the photos were visible to the jury was a strategy that the prosecution probably hoped would work in their favor. Detective Ryan continued giving evidence and revealed that the police found numerous paper towels with reddish-brown stains in a white plastic bag in a blue trash can in the garage by the wall near the entrance. Similarly, stained paper towels were also found in the fireplace in the basement. This was also presented to the jury. Now, so far, by the looks of it, this murder trial is going as expected. Experts, police officers, witnesses were giving their testimonies and photo exhibits were shown both to the public and to the jury. Now, it might seem boring and a lot of murder trials are quite boring like that because they have to go through the motions of going through all the evidence questioning the witnesses, cross-examining the witnesses. But with this trial, something unexpected happened. The prosecution tried to introduce one piece of evidence that I have not told you about yet. The prosecution tried to introduce a baseball bat with reddish-brown stains that the police found in the garage as well. Seconds after the bat was taken out of a paper evidence bag in court, defense attorney Robin Lord objected, saying that the bat was not relevant. The presiding judge in the trial sustained her objection, and the bat did not become part of the official batch of evidence. 
Later on, the detective would say that when the home was being searched, the police did not know what had caused Michelle's head wounds. Remember, she had three deep lacerations in her forehead. And the police had taken the bat because the bat had stains on it, which looked like blood, thinking that maybe the bat was part of what Jonathan used to harm Michelle, which would negate what he had told the police in his untaped and taped statement, where he said he had merely pushed Michelle with force onto the garage floor. Now, the bat became a bit of a controversial thing. During a trial recess, assistant prosecutor Doris Gallucci, who was handling the case for the state with Mr. Mide, was asked by the press if the prosecution was planning to bring the bat into evidence later on. Ms. Gallucci said that she was not sure yet. After the recess, Detective Ryan continued giving evidence, and during this part in his testimony, pictures of Michelle's lifeless body was shown again. Further exhibits were presented to the jury, such as the dock cider shoes that were found in the closet in the couple's bedroom. Detective Ryan explained that he collected the shoes because the pattern on the bottom of the dock cider shoes appeared to be similar to the patterns found on the garage floor, the bloody footprint pattern, that is. These were also used to compare to the cast impression made at the crime scene where Michelle was found. Needless to say, these shoes belonged to Jonathan. As the trial progressed, the police investigators were also called as witnesses. They were asked for their opinion as to Jonathan's version of events. Now remember, these were the investigators who were able to interrogate Jonathan those days after Michelle was found. They explained that Jonathan made up the entire story about the extortion attempt by Miguel de Jesus, or at least that was their suspicion. He probably, according to them, hoped to save his marriage by warding off the other man and making Michelle believe that Miguel de Jesus was some bad, money-hungry opportunist. They explained that as for Michelle's death, they believed that she was murdered in the garage and that the fatal hit was sustained from Jonathan hitting her with a baseball bat. They added that Michelle's condition was then not further helped when Jonathan threw her onto the floor with force. They said that they believed Jonathan then put Michelle's lifeless body into the SUV to stage the accident at the embankment. When asked about Jonathan's accusation about Michelle attempting to stab him with a stiletto shoe, the investigators explained that they did not find any stiletto shoe in the garage further giving them the impression that Jonathan had lied about Michelle's actions in the garage that night. Surprisingly, Miguel de Jesus was also at the trial. He took the stand and testified about how Jonathan had threatened to kill him. He also testified as to his affair with Michelle. This gave the defense much needed fuel because at this point, it was becoming clear that the defense were going for a passion provocation manslaughter, working hard, therefore, to avoid a murder conviction, which carries a heavier sentence. Now, in a lot of legal systems, such a crime is indeed recognized. Passion and or provocation are in these circumstances considered as legitimate mitigatory defenses. The tests might vary in each country, but the most important thing for someone accused of such a crime is the resulting sentence. As I said, if somebody is convicted of murder, the sentence would be longer than if someone is convicted of a crime of passion, so to speak. Now, 
As the trial neared its conclusion, it became apparent to the parties involved that the judge looked on Jonathan rather favorably, perhaps due to Jonathan's past professional achievement. And ultimately, such a thing could be advantageous for sentencing, but first, the jury needed to return with a verdict. After five weeks, the trial finally ended. The jury took three days to come to a verdict. The jury returned with a guilty verdict. Jonathan Nice was guilty of passion, provoked manslaughter, and not of murder. The jury deemed that Jonathan acted in the heat of passion when he confronted Michelle in the garage. The presiding judge during sentencing only ordered an eight-year custodial sentence. Jonathan was to serve his sentence at Southwoods State Prison. As expected, Jonathan appealed the court's conviction, but an appeals court upheld the conviction in May of 2009. I guess it did not matter in the end because Jonathan was in fact released from jail after only five years on the 5th of December 2010. He received credit for good behavior and for the time he spent incarcerated before sentencing. So, what did Jonathan do after he was released? Jonathan moved in with his parents and he reunited with his three children. Later on, he wrote an ebook called Under Color of Law The Deliberate Conviction of an Innocent Man and the Destruction of a Family. A lot of people viewed this effort to publish a book as something to vindicate himself. And personally, I found it rather audacious of him to publish anything at all. In his literary effort, he changed his story about the way Michelle died and the nature of her relationship with Miguel de Jesus. Jonathan alleged that de Jesus initially got Michelle into bed by drugging her, then took to stalking her. Jonathan blamed Michelle's death on de Jesus, saying she died clutching de Jesus' black hair in her hands, and her fatal injuries probably came from falling off the Mounts Motel balcony where she spent her last night on earth with de Jesus. Jonathan also claimed that the only reason Michelle was in that motel that night before she died was that she was duped into thinking there was a baby shower there. This was all a fallacy because the police never found any of this in their investigation. You would think that after being blessed with a shorter sentence, Jonathan would just stay private and not stir the pot anymore, but this ebook surely caused a lot of hurt to those who loved Michelle. You would also think that Jonathan would stay out of trouble given his history, but that would not be the case. In 2020, Jonathan was accused of bilking desperate pet owners online by selling unapproved drugs he claimed were capable of curing canine cancer. Jonathan was indicted on charges of wire fraud and interstate shipment of misbranded animal drugs. There is currently no update about this case. However, if I do hear something about the case and whether Jonathan would be imprisoned for what he did last year, then I will be the first one to update you. Now, when researching this case, a lot of things did not sit right with me. The media really latched on to this affair between Michelle and Miguel and made sure to portray it as sordidly as possible. I get that that makes for great headlines and ratings, but bear in mind that one never really knows what goes on in a relationship, except for the two people involved in said relationship. I also feel that by giving Jonathan a short sentence that was cut even shorter, he virtually got away with killing someone who he sought to control 
during their marriage. Ultimately, I think Michelle did not get justice, especially because Jonathan got to raise their children and potentially influence the narrative about their mother. Whilst I'm not saying that Michelle was perfect, having an affair did not necessitate being killed. She deserved to live and continue being a mother to her children. I just hope that her children will see that despite her imperfections, she had every right to live and that their father needed to take responsibility. His ebook sure does not show that he was sorry or that he takes responsibility for what had happened despite his confession back in 2004. I do still hope that he sleeps well at night. And with that, I want to end this rather long bonus episode. I hope you liked this episode because I certainly feel that this story is not really the end of it, especially with Jonathan's case still pending. Feel free to comment on this Patreon post or suggest cases you think could be interesting for our bonus series here on Patreon. Thank you again very much for listening and for supporting Lagim Podcast. Marami salamat. See you next time and mabuhay.